Hello, welcome to week six, Pivoting During the Pandemic, Smart Manufacturing and 3D Printing. I'm Susan Nash, and I'm Director of Innovation, Emerging Science and Technology at AAPG. I'm really happy to have a fantastic group today. We have uh, Brent Kisling, who's Executive Director, Oklahoma Department of Commerce. We have um, Hani El Shahawe of, of, of Shell. We have Tali Roseman, who is um, General Manager of 3D Printing at Xerox. We have Nora Touré, who's Vice President of, of Strategy at Evaldi Group. And she's also the founder of Women in 3D Printing. So before we get started, I just want to go through and, and just have each of the panelists go ahead and, and, and introduce themselves. Um, um, we have Dr. Larry Davis also, I'd like to introduce him, and he's, the, um, um, he's a professor of economics at Texas A&M, Texarkana. So, so, Larry, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, well, Susie just introduced me and told me where I hang my hat at A&M, Texarkana. I'm uh, happy to be here and to see the, uh, see the great attendance in that. It keeps growing each week. And this 3D printing phenomenon is one of the most fascinating things that I've been exposed to. We have some of the printers at the university, and I saw, I saw a demonstration of that a couple of years ago and never did get back to it. But uh, with these series of presentations to see what the capabilities are, I mean, I see even beyond what's been discussed, it's, it's phenomenal. And uh, I'm just thrilled to be a part of this, to just be an audience to listen to the presentations related to that. Oh, great. Well, thank you. And um, I'm really looking forward to a really informative experience today. Honey, uh, would you like to, um, would you like to go next? Sure, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Susan, for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, so my name is Hani Shahawi. I'm currently deep water digitalization lead uh, and also formation testing and sampling uh, principal technical expert here at Shell. I've been with Shell for the last 17 and a half years or so, and uh, my previous job was uh, in a team called Game Changer, which I think uh, about a week ago, uh, Hai Bin Zhu, who's with the Game Changer as well, uh, spoke. So Game Changer works with startups and entrepreneurs, and I still actually, um, I'm quite active with Game Changer at the moment, both through my digital capacity and otherwise. Uh, before Shell, I uh, was with Schlumberger for about 15 years, working in, uh, in about 10 countries, Africa, Asia, North America, uh, Middle East, and uh, yeah, pretty active with SPE, SPWLA, and uh, I've been also working with Susan on the UPITCH uh, effort since its inception, so happy again to be here. Oh, that's great. Um, if you don't mind, you might talk a little bit about what UPITCH is. So I think it's something that we're, we're um, incorporating. Yeah, so, you know, uh, UPIT is uh, one of those really interesting uh, innovation programs that uh, uh, I've been uh, involved with over the last couple of years. And, and UPIT is specifically catered really to the uh, G and G community, you know, so it started largely with a, as an AAPG effort. And then, you know, I think uh, became quite active in several other affiliated efforts, particularly at, uh, 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 you know, the shale focused uh, uh, consortia. And um, and I think it must be three years now. Uh, Susan, of course, is a, you know she was the driving force behind all of this, and she's assembled a, I guess, an advisory team, you know, representing uh, uh, majors, uh, large service companies, uh, several startups, and uh, the idea is to provide uh, on the sidelines of, you know, uh, some of those. Uh, events like, for example, the AAPG uh, annual meeting or, um, uh, or, or others, uh, the, the opportunity for uh, startups to have a space where they go through their pitches and, uh, you know, meet one-on-one -on -one with potential interested customers uh, and, um, you know, that's right. Uh, and it's yeah, it's been very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and it's expanded because now it's not just startups; it's also ones who are having an innovative sure. product that want um, commercialization. Uh, that's true. That's true. That's and there were true. even at some point actually, um, you know, companies that uh, had uh, opportunities to share, you know, sort of uh, 
partnership opportunities in, uh, in in terms of EMP, right? Right. Yeah, so it's, it's expanded quite a lot. And actually, I personally have met several of the startups that I ended up working with through the through the program. So it's been quite interesting and fulfilling for me personally. That's great. So thank you, honey. As, um, my next person I'd like to introduce and have speak uh, a little bit would be uh, Tali Roseman. Would you like to talk a little bit about what you do and what Xerox is doing with, with 3D printing? And, and then we'll go to Nora. <laughs> I think you're muted. Hey, Susan, can you hear me well? Yes, perfect. All right, uh, so thank you and uh, evening to everybody. Very happy to be here. My name is Tally Roseman. I'm the general manager for 3D printing in Xerox. Uh, Xerox has been uh, playing in the uh, 3D printing industry for uh, quite a few years. Uh, although we've been doing a lot of that behind the scenes and um, white label and, and licensing, uh, you know, we're changing that and we're going to take uh, our solutions to market under the Xerox brand name, which I think will be great. Uh, I think, and I'm looking forward to talking about how 3D printing can help uh, build resiliency into supply chains generally and in the oil and gas industry specifically. So thank you again for having me. Oh, you're welcome. We're really thrilled to ha that you're here. And so I'd also like to introduce Nora Toure and have her speak a little bit about what she does and also about women in 3D printing. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, so yeah, so my name is Nora. Uh, I've been in 3D printing for uh, the last uh, 10 years, actually, that's, that's easy. Uh, so I started in a service bureau back in France. Um, so name school too, I spent eight years with them. So uh, basically worked on different kind of applications as a service bureau while you get to see a little bit of everything. Uh, and one of the applications that I really loved uh, seeing is really seeing how 3D printing can be used uh, to disrupt supply chain, specifically in uh, heavy industry. So that's what got me uh, to join Evaldi Group. Um, so I'm, I'm working for Evaldi Group as uh, the VP strategy, it's been two years now. Uh, and so at Evaldi Group, uh, we're, so we've noticed basically that, as I think everyone will know here and, and, and agree that shipping replacement parts is expensive and reliable and most of the time just wasteful. Uh, and so we thought that 3D printing could be an answer to that. So even more than 3D printing, really distributed manufacturing combined with digital distribution. Uh, and happens that 3D printing is the perfect tool for that. Uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to talk about it in, you know, in this panel. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, I'm not sure how much you want me to expand on what uh, Ivaldi is and the activities we're having right now, if you want to wait a little bit. Um, but I can jump on, I can also introduce women in 3D printing, so I'm <laughs> trying to, to make it quick. Uh, <laughs> so um, in addition to uh, working with uh, Ivaldi Group, I'm the founder of uh, Women in 3D Printing. Uh, so this is a nonprofit uh, created about six years ago. Uh, so we're really on a mission to promote and support uh, the female leaders in our industry. Uh, with the goal, of course, of uh, closing a little bit more uh, the gender gap uh, in additive manufacturing, because we are at the crossroad of tech and manufacturing. Uh, so there's quite a lot of some work to be done there uh, in closing the gender gap. So that's long story short, a uh, little bit about me and 3D printing. It's really impressive. And I was looking at the website and I think, well, I'm going to start attending things. And you had a great event today, this morning, that I really wanted to attend, but I had a conflict. No worries. We recorded the event, uh, so I'm happy to share the link with uh, oh, anyone who's interested. Definitely. Let's, let's definitely share that afterwards. That's great. Thank you. So one of our goals for this event is to talk about how we are basically helping people pivot, and we're sharing stories about how we may have pivoted ourselves a bit, but the, the thing is, to basically look at where the opportunities are emerging and how we are changing as an economy and a society. And I think one of the first things we talked about in our first event is we talked about where will investment be in the next 18 to 24 months? And with the, the obvious answer is where it would not be. 
would not be in drilling and exploration. They would not be in, um, in certain other things that, <clears throat> um, that just make no sense that they will, but as we go through the pandemic and as we go through the, the repercussions of, of shocks of like oil price, et cetera, you can almost see stages of, of needs. So, you know, the first one starting with survival, but then now they're getting into more things like um, repairing supply chain. But then as we do that, we become more resilient. So this, this week, our focus was smart manufacturing, which is that convergence of, of analytics and it, uh, small manufacturing, a lot of 3D printing. A few years ago, we had a, a, a a really interesting analytics workshop that, uh, with APG, <clears throat> and it was in Houston. We, and one of the presentations had to do with, with um, using machine learning for predicting when there are going to be failures in parts. And I thought, oh my goodness, right now, that's so interesting because instead of being predicting the failure when, when to have to re, re, um, reorder, now you can, predict the, the failure, then instead of just saying, okay, I'm sending my part, um, you can actually send the um, specifications to have it 3D printed along with the purchase order and doesn't have to go to an in intermediate inventory warehouse or anything, just go straight to the application. So you cut out time and expense and you add have some value add, which in my mind adds more value to the 3D printing process itself here, and it gives a premium. So you don't even have to have things like stuck in ports or, and, and you don't have to replace your uh, widgets of all different kinds. Um, and you don't have to replace overseas manufacturing. You just give yourself options. And also the other thing that we had talked about a little bit is but just the fact that it gives me, people the ability to customize their processes and give a, 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 a competitive edge right away. So anyway, um, I invited Brent um, Kisling to be here today, and I think he's having some, some logistics difficulties. So I don't see him here, but that's okay. I've been in touch with, I was in touch with him today. And um, so Brent, if you're here, and I'm not seeing you, <laughs> raise your hand. But um, I think that he's been, delayed, which is, is, is understandable. So I'll just basically go over what, what Oklahoma is doing. Susan, and, uh, pardon? Can I interrupt just a minute? Sure. We, I, have a, I just have a question, maybe a semi-brilliant idea. We've okay. had these speeches each week in the discussion. Uh -huh. Would it be possible for someone to bring in uh, one of the 3D printers and have just a lecture and demonstration, uh, you know, show a sample of what they do? Yes, Tali, we're here. He's here. All right. <laughs> and so <is> Nora. <laughs> Pardon? And Nora's here too. All so right. yeah, I mean, at least uh, as for Xerox, yeah, we'll be happy to uh, maybe show a uh, you know kind of a live video. Um, Perfect. Of the printer. <laughs> Excellent. Great. So I'll just um, I'll just use up. Um, I'll, we'll just. Um, sort of zoom through what Brent was going to talk about and we'll give more time for the demos. <laughs> so he was just basically going to talk about the um, projects and, and um, the different incentives that the Oklahoma government has put in place. And I think every government has done this. And then as well as, as, um, as international governments are encouraging um, diversification and partnering. And, and I, I, I noticed that Devin is here at Racy's with um, the, working with Israel and they are providing incentives for people to try out um, um, Israeli technology. So there are just so many opportunities. And the, what the Oklahoma um, state government, the Department of Commerce has done is they've given um, tax breaks but also have uh, um, given startup funds for people to change and to pivot. And sometimes that means expanding their abilities to do 3D printing, to, to um, adapt and quickly modify what they're doing to meet needs. 
So a lot of it had to do with things like um, personal protective equipment, but then also things like uh, portable dialysis when it's harder to go to the hospital. So anyway, I just wanted to give an overview of that. And so we'll, we'll switch over now to Hani El Shahawi, and he's going to give us an overview of, of additives and smart manufacturing. And then we'll see the real things in action with Nora and, and, <laughs> and, and, and also with, um, um, what's Xerox with um, Tali? Uh, just to uh, manage your expectation, I don't have an actual 3D printer with me in my bedroom. <laughs> so I, I just want to clarify things. Uh, happy yeah. to walk yeah. over. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> no? Thank well, you. Yeah, we're happy to, happy to show it in a future session. Yeah. <laughs> the video will be good. <laughs> anyway, thanks. Okay, Tahani, it's your turn. <laughs> and thanks, Larry, for the suggestion. Okay, honey, you might be muted. Okay, this is better? Yes. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, here we are. So uh, what I was going to say is, uh, for the sake of time, I'm, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, skip over a little bit, a lot of the detail on uh, 3D printing in particular, because, you know, we have to... Uh, experts in that domain, so I'm, I'm not going to dwell as much on the 3D printing aspect. But the title of my talk is a little bit um, more general, so it's really this marriage between materials, innovation, and smart manufacturing, which I find quite exciting. As I mentioned earlier, uh, my role is uh, digitalization lead for our deep water technology group here at Shell, and I um, look at a variety of technologies under that realm. Uh, including robotics, including additive manufacturing, um, you know, machine learning, uh, AI, and, um, you know, Internet of Things applications. Uh, but what I'm going to focus up on today is really the, you know, again, this marriage between uh, materials innovation at large and smart manufacturing. And as an introduction, um, I, I listed some of the topics I want to touch upon here, which new materials and smart manufacturing can really enhance asset integrity, reduced life cycle cost uh, of oil and gas development uh, through the use of new materials and manufacturing techniques together. Now, the topics of interest that I really uh, want to touch upon really quickly, of course, because we only got like 15 minutes, is the, the area of material informatics, uh, really uh, uh, essential for accelerated materials discovery and design. Uh, I'll touch upon nanomaterials for enhanced material coatings, recovery, and reservoir performance. Um, there's also uh, a lot of uptake on smart, non-metallic, and composite materials, and of course, additive manufacturing and 3D printing, although I'll, I'll try and keep uh, a lighter touch on those. And, uh, you know, that is really closely related also to the uptake of sensors. I mentioned IoT earlier as one of the focus areas. But one of the uses of uh, potential uses of IoT devices, Internet of Things devices, is in the incorporation of sensors within materials, within, for example, pipelines and, and similar, as well as the use of the analytics on the data for non-destructive evaluation. Uh, and then there is a whole domain of digital twin or digital thread enablement using those data and those analytics that come from that. So a lot of topics that are sort of interconnected, at least in my, in my domain. Uh, additive manufacturing, again, this is kind of a light touch. A lot of applications in the parts printing domain. So printing functional components of equipment, including, for example, molds also that you can use for traditional manufacturing. So it doesn't have to be straight up replacement of the production, but also just sort of additive uh, or, uh, uh, you know, additional to. Uh, conventional methods. Um, then there is a whole topic of novel design, creating parts with improved performance that are very difficult or possible sometimes to create using conventional techniques, whether it's uh, molding or extrusion or others. Um, visualization, 
So the ability to print 3D digital models for physical things, like for example, a reservoir model potentially, but also just you know sort of mock-ups of variety of things, and I'll show a couple of examples on those. Then there's a whole topic of customization, meaning that you can really have an extreme ability to make these bespoke components uh, that could be individualized or made at a large scale, depending on what you're trying to do, which is difficult sometimes to do with traditional manufacturing. And, uh, and I think, uh, as already been mentioned uh, briefly, the whole topic of supply chain de-risking, you know, looking for novel suppliers or just-in-time manufacturing is a big deal uh, that is enabled by, uh, by additive manufacturing. I'm going to skip over the methods because I think uh, the subsequent uh, 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 speakers are going to talk more about that. Um, but additive manufacturing in a nutshell, you know, creating objects layer by layer from 3D models in essence what it is. You can use novel structures as you're doing so, lattice structures, for example, anisotropic forms or conformal channels and other things. And I have a few pictures to show you. New materials. Like for example, multi-material objects or sensor electronics, as I mentioned earlier, embedded into the structures. You can also improve the performance by adding less weight, smaller size, and higher strength. Um, and you can use many materials, you know, steel, alloys, plastics, concrete, even food, you know, is, going, is up and coming and probably in the future will be even more uh, prevalent. The ability to print pizza or whatever it is that you can, you know, chocolate something or the other at home. Uh, there are a variety of techniques, again, that I'm not going to go into detail here, but I regard additive manufacturing, similar to robotics, as a digitalization enabler. And the linkage is because it can tie actual models to physical objects and it enables new business models. And that's kind of what digitalization in a very uh, small nutshell is. Uh, so here are some novel designs, some eye candy for you, you know, some things that would be pretty impossible to produce using conventional manufacturing techniques. But it's not just about eye candy. Um, you know, there's really a lot of functional elements to it. So, you know, the, uh, these views here are for some interesting cooling veins. It'll be, and, and this is kind of a cutaway of that. And this is what the object looks like, but you know it's very, very, very difficult uh, to manufacture this in any other way. I mean, you'd have to do lots and lots of welding or some other way of joining after you cut these non-straight channels in there. And here's another example of this, um, you know, uh, cooling uh, uh, design, which again will be very, very difficult to produce. So it's not just for display. There are some really very practical use cases for all of that. And these are not, you know, born today. You know, they've been around three, four, five years. But the uptake has been massive in the last few years. And then also there's the whole topic of printing parts. It goes again to the just-in-time manufacturing or the ability to de-risk your supply chain. So here's a notable example from GE Aviation here for a 3D printed fuel nozzle. It's part of the sleep engine. So this is five times more durable, one part instead of 18 parts, and you know 25% lighter, and it runs cooler due to internal structures eliminating the fuel coking. And you know Forbes at that time quoted you know 20, 20, 22 billion dollars in commitments at the time this was manufactured. You know, and they can produce this in masses. You know, 25,000 of these nozzles. So it shows the capability of 3D manufacturing actually. To, um, or 3D printing, additive manufacturing to, to deliver at scale, okay, not just uh, for small parts. An example on visualization, in this particular example, this is one of the offshore projects we had uh, with FPSO and a buoy system, a novel buoy system, which was designed uh, using a series of foam mega blocks. These are gigantic blocks of foam. And there was a lot of concern that the subsystem could not actually be constructed as designed, potentially causing delays in the project delivery. So a 3D print of the subsystem revealed that a design flaw where the wrong dimensions were used, but allowed uh, uh, the operator to correct this in a timely fashion and intervene before, uh, before it was uh, already manufactured in the real form factors. And this would have cost millions of dollars 
and a lot of project delays. So, you know, you're just using it to visualize, to interact, to troubleshoot, to anticipate problems in itself is a big value add. So this is kind of what it looks like, by the way, when it was manufactured. You can see it's, it's, it's a little bigger scale here. But, you know, traditionally, you just sort of go and manufacture these things and then find out about the problem. Or you just do this on a machine in a 3D model. But the, uh, the nice thing about um, additive manufacturing is it can sort of bridge that gap between um, 3D design, uh, digital twin, and physical systems. And it can help in that divide. In addition to AR, VR, and augmented reality, 3D uh, printing is another very powerful tool in doing that. Um, again, skip over this a little bit, but um, to be able to scale additive manufacturing, there's a lot of things that have to be thought about. So it's not just the technical feasibility, there's commercial feasibility that needs to be looked into. So for example, price performance, what is the market, um, you know, technological capability in terms of productivity, uh, you know, volume, capital cost of the equipment, materials, uh, you know, uh, the availability of rights to 3D designs is something that needs to be taken into account. There's some legal issues that one would have to think about in terms of intellectual property, for example, um, liability distribution and management and so on and so forth. And then importantly, just like with anything in digital, uh, there are some considerations around the ecosystem, meaning the evolving marketplace of suppliers, manufacturers, designers and service firms and so on. And of course, aligning the interest, meaning creating a value proposition that is sustainable for all parties. Uh, and I mentioned in passing the linkage to simulation digital twin in passing, but this is a critical one because digital twin is, uh, although the term is sometimes uh, overused, it really is a, such a fundamental concept in transformations, digital transformation of, uh, of industries as a whole and organizations because it ties the physical world to the digital realm. And it allows a system's view of your processes and of your systems, subsystems. And so uh, uh, 3D uh, printing is a big enabler and a big uh, um, real, you know, realization tool for digital twin, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Then I just wanna mention uh, the linkage here to design optimization. So for example, if you take it, this problem here, a very simple problem, it's essentially a truss you know, hung from a fixed uh, end and then you place a, a force. Um, consider this and just try to find a structure that minimizes compliance subject to some material constraint. Now, uh, classically you would do that through parametric optimization, shape optimization, but then if you incorporate topology optimization, then you realize that you can actually build the same object with better performance with less materials by incorporating you know uh, certain design changes in your shape so this is an example of that that this particular uh, object that you see here delivers optimal performance as opposed to for example the more conventional design so the point i'm trying to make here is that the incorporation of the digital tools that i mentioned earlier 3d printing and topology optimization which classically goes through the following stages uh, is very powerful. You start essentially with your initial domain, you discretize that domain, then you up, obtain your topology, and then you post-process that to improve the, uh, uh, the ability to manufacture, and then you verify that, and then you go to manufacturing. Uh, and uh, you know that linkage from design to manufacturing, going through uh, the optimization in the middle is a powerful one. That marriage made in heaven that I alluded to earlier. And that type of uh, bridging between uh, digital and physical is what's allowed, for example, the aerospace industry to bring the energy density of uh, airplanes. You know, if you look, for example, the Boeing 707 in the 1950s, ranging, you know, to the 787, you'll find that in terms of energy intensity, it's gone down by a factor of almost five, you know? And um, part of that has been the use of composites and already 
uh, companies like uh, Boeing and Embraer and others are printing large sections of airplanes, uh, composite sections, using 3D printing. That's already something that is happening now. As you can see here, the total material used by weight now for the 777 uh, is, uh, you know, was used to be 12% uh, uh, composites and 50% aluminium. And uh, the 787 is, you know, very large portion of it, 50% is composites. So we've gone a long way in that regard. So in summary then, to wrap it up, traditional materials and chemicals industries, um, uh, because they're experiencing, you know, uh, very similar sustainability and supply chain challenges to oil and gas, uh, as well as increased competition, more demanding uh, activist customers and investors, and really little game-changing innovation left, are uh, forced to find themselves um, thinking about how to build a more sustainable uh, value chain, more sub sustainable supply chain, more sustainable use of, uh, of materials, particularly rare earth materials and so on. Uh, and, and because of that, that is going to, if anything, I increase the uptake of uh, 3D printing as well as the digital tools and the design tools uh, affiliated with them. So expect over the coming years, faster product development and commercialization, but those will require uh, greater adoption of 3D printing and digital technologies including, of course, not just the, uh, the physical printers, but the design softwares, the printer management softwares, but also the material informatics that feeds into the design. And then finally, novel materials and composites, they create really numerous opportunities, especially at the atomic scale, because at the atomic scale, then you get some very interesting transitions in chemistry in the bonding and, uh, you know, the oxide interfaces, as well as, you know, novel, types of chemical and electronic and magnetic properties. So it opens up a whole realm of applications uh, beyond oil and gas, really, you know, all areas, microelectronics, optics, catalysis, you name it. So very exciting possibilities ahead, I think, uh, coming from this intermarriage between uh, design, tools, physical ability to print objects uh, with, uh, that are customized but at scale as well as, um, you know, the uh, advances in, uh, in uh, material informatics and such. So that's, that's it. That's what I wanted to share at this point. And uh, oh, thanks thank for you. your attention and I hand it back to you. Yeah. Yeah, th this is just tremendous. I, I really appreciate the, the um, detailed explanations and, and going in and putting the, the kind of, um, putting the, the system and the big picture together. This is really great. I have so, a quick question. How, how, what's the speed of 3D printing? For example, that uh, fuel nozzle that was shown up there, how long would it take to produce one of those 3D printer or that uh, airline, airplane component that you uh, pointed out? Yeah, I mean, I'll defer on the various um, limitations, physical limitations of, you know, the most modern printers to, to, to the experts. But uh, as, for, as far as I know, the, the parts the, that we, we have, for example, at Shell, uh, metal printers. And uh, yeah, you could produce objects in, um, you know, a couple of days, basically, that ordinarily would take, you know, many weeks to manufacture. Um, I suspect, I don't really know exactly about the, the, the wing part that uh, was shown there. But, you know, probably hours, you know, no, no more than that. It's not minutes, it's not seconds, and it's not weeks, but it's, you know, hours, maybe a day or two, but that's that's as far as I, I would know, yeah? I don't, I don't know the latest and greatest on, on that. Okay, that was a good question. So we'll have um, Tali from Xerox who can really talk more about the specifics. And thanks, thank you, honey, that was a good answer. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. So we'll um, turn it over to you, Tali. You can share your screen if you'd like to. And send it sure, back. all right. Okay, so uh, I too don't have a, you know, a printer at home. You know, the high-end uh, production printers are uh, usually half a million dollars and above, all the way to two million dollars. So that's a piece of furniture that I can't afford. Um, however, <laughs> maybe uh, because of the request, I'll, 
I'll try. Hopefully, uh, the Wi-Fi bandwidth will be good enough, and you can uh, see the video. Susan, can you uh, see the screen here? Again, it looks great. All right. So let's try to share the one-minute uh, Xerox uh, video of how the printer works, and then we can move to the uh, to the deck. That was uh, the one minute, and uh, we can go into the uh, into the deck. So, um, you know, happy to be here, and uh, thanks for the uh, interesting session so far. Um, I wanted to kind of take the opportunity and spend a few minutes. I think you guys hit already, Honey and Susan, a lot of the points that are going to be covered here, but it's really about how to build resiliency into supply chains, and specifically. You know, there's a lot of things that can be done, but I think 3D printing really hammers and some of the most massive pain points. So, you know, I think everybody we're talking about COVID and, and I do think this uh, new economic reality we're in requires supply chains to be a lot more responsive, flexible, resilient, however, which way you want to call it. And I think, you know, it, for the last few years, they've been really optimized for cost cutting and with that, supply chains lost a lot of resiliency, which was became very evident during COVID, right? So, um, so in a survey by the Institute of Supply Chain uh, Management, 75% of supply chain executives said that uh, they took a hit. You know, there's, their part supply took a massive disruption as a result of COVID. But I think what was more interesting in that survey is that half of them, half of the supply chain executives, didn't have a fallback plan, didn't have a kind of a business continuity or disaster recovery plan, which is pretty remarkable when you think about it, because in the software world, everybody has a business continuity plan. You always have backup servers. You always know what to do when one thing is down, and yet that doesn't really exist in the physical supply chain, um, which I think is really interesting, especially because 3D printing can serve as the solution for that, for the supply, for the manufacturers who want to build that resiliency and flexibility. Um, so there were a lot of benefits that were described with 3D printing in Honey's presentation. I'll just touch on the two biggest ones. The first one is obviously direct manufacturing. You have the printer, you make the part, you don't need the expensive tooling and molds. And with that, what you get is, first of all, lower volumes become more economic. And to me, lower volumes isn't just about, you know, aerospace industry where everybody's minds go to when you talk about lower volumes and 3D printing. Lower volume can just be, you know, a certain period of time of distress, and now you're having issues to get parts. And, you know, maybe in a regular steady state, you'll still continue to do it traditionally and procure the parts from your plant in China with the lead times that that, that entails. But maybe in these times, you, for this short period, these low volumes, you would want to have the option to 3D print closer to the point of consumption. Um, so lower volumes are made more economic because you don't need the expensive tooling and mold. And obviously, because you don't need them and you start the, the production right away, it's much faster and more flexible. So you can get the parts in hours 
maybe, you know, a day or two when you account for post-processing, which depending on the 3D printing technology you would use will be, you know, as time-consuming um, as the printing itself, but you don't need to wait whatever it is, four or six weeks to get the part um, from uh, China or whatever offshore location you're usually producing in. So you have this diversification of production location, the notion of the micro factory. So, you know, you can put, if you're in the U.S., you can put a printer in your East Coast, Midwest, West Coast facility, and you're basically covered. And, you know, you can even think about it as an insurance policy, if you will, to ensure that you always have this uh, supply of parts. Um, and the freedom of design and the whole notion of complexity is free. I think Honey touched on that in his presentation as well, which, you know, thank you for that. That was really interesting. You know, you gave the example of uh, GE. So, you know, in the turboprop engine, they were able to reduce the number of parts from 855 parts to just 12, which is insane when you, you know, just think about the fact that they had 855 SKUs to manage and procure from 15 different suppliers. And because of this freedom of design, and you can make geometries that you couldn't do before, and what you previously needed a lot of parts and then weld them together, and now you can just print that part, they were able to reduce them from 15 suppliers, 855 SKUs, into 12 parts, one supplier, which you know gives you a ton of cost savings, and for sure, a lot of resiliency into your supply chain. There are many more examples. If you go and you Google DFAM, Design for Additive Manufacturing, um, you know, Jabel just did a case study uh, reducing the number of parts for a cooling fan from 73 parts into one, um, which is phenomenal. Uh, local Motors uh, with their 3D printed card and only has 50 parts instead of a few thousands that a regular car would have. Um, so all these examples now obviously you can also use it to improve properties where we're talking about weight reduction. So before joining Xerox 3D printing, I was actually in Stratasys and, um, you know, in GrabCAD and in, in the online community today, I did a, a challenge, a design challenge to help a customer reduce weight for an aircraft bracket. And we reduced the weight by 84%. So it just weighted 16% of uh, the original weight while keeping the same mechanical properties, same everything. So these benefits you can really only get with 3D printing. And so, you know, to maximize the benefits of 3D printing, I think a lot of it is about adopting this design for additive mindset. How do you not just take the traditional CAD design and say, can I 3D print it? But you take that and you say, now let's optimize this part for 3D printing, like you can see in this image, and you can see that in some of Honey's images. How do you maintain the same properties but reduce weight? And better yet, instead of doing it at the part level, let's do it at the assembly level, right? And then we can slash the number of parts that we need, we can slash the number of SKUs, we can reduce the number of suppliers and make our lives much easier. That's one side of the, of the equation. I think the other side is that companies really have to rethink certain elements of their supply chain. Um, I can tell you, you know, this kind of table here on the right is exactly what we're doing now in Xerox as we're implementing 3D printing in our own supply chain, uh, specifically for our spare parts and other areas as well. Um, but we looked at, you know, when we started a lot of the conversations and we're, when we're talking to a lot of customers, it's oftentimes, well, you know, I can procure this for $10 from, uh, you know, the plant in China. Can you make it for $9 with 3D printing? But really, you know, those $10 don't include a lot of hidden fees, you know, be it the shipping or the shipping risk and everything else that's associated with it and the tooling and, and all that uh, good stuff. But I think aside from all the hidden fees that are not always counted for, there's the loss gain. So I'll give you an example from Xerox. And if this is true for Xerox, I know this to be exponentially true 
in oil and gas. So we have high-end printers, like the million dollar plus 2D printers that sit with customers. And one of our business models is paper print. So for every day, for every hour even, that those printers are not printing, we're losing a ton of money. And if we're missing a spare part for one of those printers, and it takes us four weeks to get it, you know, that's tens of thousands of lost revenue because we couldn't get the part. And in that point in time, the fact that you have a 3D printing in your East Coast, Midwest, West Coast location, and you can get the part in a day or two, again, the printing itself takes a few hours, I'm counting for post-processing and everything, the fact that you can get it in a day or two or four weeks, at that point, you don't care if it's $10 or $9 or even $100 because it's a strategic item that you really need uh, and you have a supply risk with it and it impacts your profit. So I, I really think this is the way that companies should be thinking about it. Um, and so I kind of, you know, I'm not going to talk a lot about, you know, Xerox, but, you know, happy if you want to learn more and reach out offline. But this is exactly what we're trying to do. And, you know, honey, I appreciate you raising some of the challenges that 3D printing has. I agree. There are challenges on the technology front. There are challenges on the cost front. And I think there's some kind of business challenge and ecosystem uh, challenges that need to be solved for 3D printing to get more mainstream adoption and for companies to reap the benefits. And, you know, this is exactly what we're trying to do in Xerox. Um, so with that, you know, Susan, I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, that's great. I think we have time for one or two questions and then we'll, we'll move to... Um next presentation any any quick questions i've made it so that anybody can un unmute themselves so let's see if um whoops i think um well i have a question okay okay so the question i have is oh let's see oh, i was going to see um I think that some people are not allowed to talk. Oops. So the question I have is, is how flexible are you in terms of, of the kinds of printers that you can, can if somebody say purchases a printer, um, can it use different types of, of metals or does it have just one feedstock? Yeah, so great question. I mean, for our metal printer right now, it's uh, focused on aluminum, but uh, we're going to launch additional materials as we move forward. Um, you know, I think different kind of 3D printers have different material capabilities. By the way, I think one of the interesting points is a side comment maybe, is in our discussions with customers and also in our discussions with Xerox internally, one of the mindset changes that we're seeing it's not about, well, I used to make it with uh, Inconel. Can you make it with Inconel? It's here are the properties that I need. Can you, with whatever materials you guys are offering, give me the same properties, even if it's a different material? Which I think is also really interesting. Oh, definitely. Definitely. So I noticed that Aaron, Aaron's in the um, here. Uh, oh, did, Larry, did you have a question? Aaron Lavin is a. Um, 3D printer, so he'd be interesting to talk to as well. Anyway, Larry, did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question last uh, week about, uh, you know, metals. Uh, you just mentioned aluminum. And one of the things that I mentioned, I guess a couple of weeks ago, when people are getting replacement teeth, the process they use seems to be very archaic and imprecise. Are there any materials that these printers could use to make replacement uh, teeth or uh, caps yeah absolutely and i think you're seeing it with a few companies on the polymer side of the industry that are recently starting to get uh fda uh certified materials so actually i think dental is actually one of the more advanced markets interestingly are, for what, 3d printing what kind of materials would you use i mean you know you don't want you don't want aluminum teeth <laughs> We, you know, typically, <laughs> typically use porcelain and some other materials. So what type of materials would they be able to use with this? Uh, with, uh, yeah, so there's some, some uh, specific resins that are actually addressing it. I'm, uh, 
you know, I, I don't have the names at the top of my head, but happy to take it offline and shoot you some, uh, some of those names. That's quite interesting. And it does open up the whole conversation of medical 3D printing and the smaller, no, it doesn't have to be large, it can be small. Exactly. And I think, you know, I, and, I, and I really think, you know, to the point that you guys were making, because lower volumes are becoming economic, you can really do the mass customization, right? To so think about medical, it's no longer kind of a small, medium, large. You can really make things specifically tailored, fully customized to the person and make it still economically viable. So given the speed back to the teeth thing, typically if you get a, if you get a crown, it takes a couple of weeks to, for the imprint to go to a lab and they make it and come back. With the 3D printing, maybe it could be a, a, a one-day turnover? Uh, I mean, I think really the vision and things like that, which are really small and can be printed really fast, is that you can even get it, you know, in the visit that yeah. you will have. I mean, I think that will require additional capabilities around software mm -hmm. um, and I think around the ease of use. And the concern that, you know, you might have with some uh, 3D printing technology around, uh, you know, especially with powders, uh, powder-based technologies, you'll have some concerns around safety and everything. So you wouldn't want to put it in the, uh, in the dentist's office or in the lab. But I think we're seeing a lot of technologies that are addressing those concerns and are addressing the simplification of the workflows such that, you know, I do believe that in kind of five, ten years from now, we're going to be seeing it. That makes sense, especially in, in the larger things like prosthetics. I mean, that's a big, big area already. But, um, wow, it's great. Well, good question, Larry. And, um, well, thank you, Tali. This is really, really informative. We'll move over to sure. Nora. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Move to Nora, and she can talk a little bit about more specific examples as well. So one, other quick, Nora. one other quick question just came to mind. Would it be capable of making glasses, glass lenses, you know, for glasses? Yeah, there are actually, there is uh, already a few uh, companies working on that. Absolutely. See, my field is not engineering and uh, listening to all this stuff is blowing my mind. I've had limited exposure to them at our university. Uh, engineering is in our department. They've got three of the... You know, you know, small 3D printers, and I was fascinated with the first things I saw, but it's blowing my mind to see the capabilities of listening to you guys. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's turn it over to Nora, and she can elaborate. <laughs> well, uh, my presentation is nowhere as good as the one from Tali or Honey, so I'm actually feeling a little bit bad. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll try to add more. Uh, so I could, Suzanne, do you, do you want me to share my screen or do you have the presentation? Um, I have it, but it, um, I'm kind of, it seems like I'm been sort of in depth today, so it might be good if you share it. Okay, let me try because I have a lot of... But I have, here, so I have it up me... just in case, so I have a backup. No, let's give it a try. Um, <laughs> share, let's see. Can you confirm you see my screen? Perfect. Oh, we'll work uh, the first try. Right. <laughs> so in this case, it will look like I'm not looking at you just because I have my second screen here. So uh, I apologize in advance if it looks like a little bit weird. Uh, so anyway, uh, as I was saying, like I only have four slides anyway, so it's not going to be uh, too long. Um, but again, uh, thank you, Hani and Tali, for uh, this really good overview, actually. Uh, so as I said, I have 10 years uh, experience in additive manufacturing, and uh, my, my presentation is nowhere as good as yours. <laughs> so uh, again, I'll try to do my best to give as much as I can here. Um, so uh, I guess I said it in the beginning in the introduction, but um, so I want to start with this. So shipping replacement parts is extensive and reliable and wasteful. So I've said it in the beginning, I think we, most of us here are agreeing on this, otherwise we wouldn't be uh, in this event. Uh, and so I would like just to expand on this a little bit. So some of the things we've noticed is that transportation cost uh, is most of the time responsible up to 50% of the cost of uh, uh, a gold um, goods sold, sorry, uh, the COGS. Um, so this, this is massive. Uh, so this has to change, it's not normal. We're also noticing that uh, having six to eight weeks uh, of delivery windows is 
actually the average, um, which I find really shocking. I didn't know that before joining this industry. Uh, and actually, Tali, I think you, you talked about the issues of downtime, uh, and I think you're totally right. Uh, so same thing, this is an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, and another thing we've noticed is that international freight is responsible for an average of 7% uh, of the global CO2 emission, uh, which is huge. Um, so those are some of the issues we've seen uh, and that we are trying actually to fix, uh, but we're a startup, so we need everyone uh, <laughs> everyone's help to do that. Um, but so we, we've talked extensively about the technical benefits uh, of additive manufacturing for specific parts, which is really good. We need to talk about this. But I think for an actual implementation and disruption of the current supply chain and disrupting and you know really fixing the issues I've talked about earlier, we need to look into the actual numbers. Uh, and when I'm talking about actual numbers, it's looking at what procurement data looks like. Uh, and one of the problem right now is that uh, it's really hard uh, to track down the total cost of ownership of a part. Because most of the time when you are have a line for spare parts in procurement, well, it's not tied to any shipping costs or any of that. So we just have a cost for a part, but nothing that goes around it in terms of like shipping costs, inventory costs, warehousing costs, uh, and all of, all of that. So, and when you're comparing just the cost of an additive manufactured part compared to a traditional part, and you don't take into account all the logistics around it, it's just like comparing, I don't know, bananas and apple. Um, so this is the work we're doing actually with Vivaldi, trying to basically match a banana and apple somehow. Um, <laughs> the way I'm saying this is, sounds like mission impossible, uh, but you're actually managing to do a few things. So let me show you exactly what we do. So, and again, I apologize if it sounds like a sales pitch, that was not my intention, uh, but I just want to touch base on the activities we're having uh, because we, though we've been in business for a little bit over three years now, and so we've had some experience. So we, we've screened over a million items uh, for additive manufacturing. So that gave us um, some, some edge on, on this. Um, so we have six activities here, which I would like to compile into three. Um, so the first one is really screening for additive manufacturing. Uh, and again, I think, Hani, you, you talked about it earlier, um, but it is really important to look at what makes sense for additive manufacturing. So when you're looking at uh, a part that technically can be 3D printed, let's take, for example, a fork, it might not make sense to 3D print it, actually. So you also need to look at, is it actually making sense? So I want to 3D print this. Um, and so to know that you actually need to look into procurement data because there is more than just like, does it make sense? Uh, you know, technically you also need to look at all the commercial aspects that are going uh, with it. Um, so as I said, we screen over a million parts uh, coming from uh, over 400 sites. Um, so again, we're reviewing them for printability. And I do apologize if you hear my son. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it is working from home, right? So that yeah, it comes with it. Uh, anyway, uh, so we're reviewing for printability and commercial viability. Um, so that's one of the activities we're having. Uh, and actually that includes also structuring of the data because um, most of the time the data is all over the place. Um, so we are basically doing field studies, interviews with procurement team and you know operators as well, doing top-down analysis uh, to actually figure out what we need to look at and where to find the information and the data. So this is a really important work that needs to be done that's most, most of the time overlooked, uh, but it is, it is critical. We need to look into this data to know where we're going. Um, second activity we're having uh, is the product qualification and certification. Uh, and this is what I call it in here, uh, product qualification and business case identification, as well as digitization, testing, and certification of qualifying products. So once we know uh, we've looked at the data and we've screened, then we can actually make a business case. And that means uh, basically qualifying products. So, so far we've digitized close to 1500 parts, um, mostly spare parts. Uh, and when we're digitizing, we're actually providing as well performance envelopes. Uh, and I don't remember if it was Tali or Hani talking about that, but basically it's more than just providing a digital twin. We're also looking at the performance of the, the 3D printed part uh, compared to the traditional part, um, the original part. So we're also doing uh, material conversion. Uh, so 
to see what material is the closest to what you actually need for the part to perform at least as well as the original part. Um, so this is part of uh, our digitization uh, services. Um, I have to say all of our facilities and we have sites uh, in uh, California, Mexico and Singapore, they are all ISO 9001 certified. Um, and we've also been applied, um, involved, sorry, uh, with uh, the DNVGL uh, creation of certification uh, guidelines uh, for 3D printed uh, certificate, uh, critical parts. So this is kind of uh, what we do in terms of digitization and certification. And the third aspect, uh, if you want to do a full scope, you know, end-to-end -end, uh, implementation of uh, digital distribution is to look into the distributed manufacturing. So we go from giving recommendations to actual implementation. So we're actually building local mic micro factories uh, with various kinds of technologies. So we are completely brand agnostic in terms of uh, 3D printing technologies. We're actually not excluding working with other technologies than 3D printing, because sometimes 3D printing might not be the one solution, um, technical solution uh, for, for some parts. So depending on the companies we're working with, their structure, we give recommendations on what technologies they should implement. And then we do the actual implementation. Um, so we've delivered, uh, over 100 parts so far. Um, so we made the first delivery, uh, I think it was a world first uh, delivery of a scupper plug uh, to uh, uh, merchant vessels earlier this year. So we actually have a few vessels going around with a 3D printed scupper plug, um, which we're pretty happy about it. Um, and yeah, so um, I guess that's it about Evaldi that I wanna, sorry, I'm trying to make it quick so we have time for Q&A. Uh, I, I, I know, Suzanne, you asked me to also talk about women in 3D printing, so it might seem like a stretch, but I'm gonna talk real quick about <laughs> women in 3D oh, dude, printing. Yes, absolutely. Unless you want me, I can actually take inspiring. questions uh, first on Evaldi. I'm not sure how you want me to do this. I'm sure we can take a few questions about the process and then we can talk about women in 3D printing. Okay, let's do that then. Okay. Any questions or any comments? Um, I don't know if Aaron is in the audience, if he um, has any questions or comments about his own experience with 3D printing. And I noticed that um, John Hoffmeister is in the audience and he's, he does a lot with um, digitization strategy. And it, it might be interesting to get your, your uh, perspective, John, on on how this type of thing fits in within a leadership and, and digitization strategy. I might have to see if I can. Otherwise, I'm happy to pass along my contact information I, and take this offline if oh, there are other questions. I, I see one question actually, uh, I'll read it out from Richard Zhu. It oh, says, okay, in good. normal manufacturing, QC, QA is a big part in the 3D printing. Is the concept changed? And if so, how, how is it accomplished? No, QC is, uh, is, is really important. Um, so there are specific processes. Um, so today there, there are some standards based on the different technologies and different materials, uh, which of course we're respecting. And we're also in addition coming with our own uh, QC process. Um, so yeah, it is absolutely uh, maybe even more important uh, than with other manufacturing technologies because it is new. Uh, and some people might be waiting for it to fail, uh, so it's even more important to be really thorough uh, with uh, QC procedures. I hope that answered your question. That's good. And I just checked the little Q and A thing. Is the first time I noticed the little boxes. Anyway, well, I think yeah. as you share your screen, you cannot see them. So if there are others, please please pass them because I yeah, I, think I just can't see them there. Yeah, here's yeah, the Q and A. And Calvin has a question. Calvin, did you want to open up your mic and and ask it or? Do you I already typed actually, uh, he can do that, but I already typed actually an answer to him. Oh, okay. Well, the question was, are there specific oil and gas examples in deep water or elsewhere? If it's parts, then they won't see the, well, then won't the original equipment manufacturers be the ones most likely to implement this? So anyway, Hani, would you mind sharing what you? Yeah. Um... So, so what I, I mentioned to him is that actually that FPSO um, disconnect design that I showed, that does come from a deep water project actually. And in this case, it's done by the operator. So it's not a commercially supplied part, it's actually designed 
implemented by the operator. Um, and uh, but it's a you know it's a singular part, but it's a really expensive part, like tens of millions of dollars. And it is a critical aspect of of uh, you know of the project. In fact, the project wouldn't go ahead without that particular piece. Now, there's also a lot of applications by operators themselves directly in LNG and GTL, gas to liquid, and uh, uh, in several parts of the downstream because of the heavy use of catalysts, heat exchangers. But uh, beyond these somewhat niche applications, uh, there's a big opportunity, I would imagine, for a lot of EPC companies. Uh, for example, in the subsea realm, you know, it's a great place to adopt the technology because you have um, few but really critical components. And uh, there's also very significant supply chain uh, dependencies uh, in, in that realm because, you know, you have these huge things that can wait on a, you know, huge assemblies that can wait multi hundreds of millions of dollars that wait on, you know, some critical valves or, or you know, plugs or whatever. Uh, so that presents actually quite an opportunity. So the EPC companies in general have been have been uh, picking up these technologies and, and essentially it's a way for them to lower cost, to uh, accelerate delivery, and of course to de-risk their own supply chains. So I really there's like, a lot of room. Yeah. yeah, I like what you're saying because it shows a partnership between the operator and the part so that it's, it's, um, it's more efficient and more effective. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, too, we had a couple of weeks ago, we had 3D Dynamics talked about their smart pipe. And they did 3D printing, but they embedded sensors in the pipe. So there is another huge opportunity for, um, but it, and you mentioned this too, Hani, about the um, Internet of Things and Industrial Internet of Things, but basically incorporating that uh, real-time potential by having sensors in the piece. The, then, of course, the, the skeptical side of me says, hmm, if one sensor goes bad, that's like a big part that goes wrong. It's all one piece, but oh well. <laughs> Those things can be worked out. Right. And yeah, I actually had a um, question for you. I don't know if we, if we can already jump into the, the Q&A part uh, <laughs> of uh, the event. But uh, so you mentioned like uh, some parts are actually coming from the operators themselves. Uh, and I'd be curious to know how you're handling uh, then the relationship with uh, original equipment manufacturers and certification of uh, critical components. Uh, is this something you, you're you doing it just for equipment that is out of guarantee or how do you handle that? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. That is one of the areas that I mentioned that are somewhat contentious, whether, you know, reverse engineering something. That's, that's a tough place to go. But in the examples that I showed that are kind of a no-brainer are ones where they're either just, you know, not supported, period, the supplier has gone out of business, and or they're actually niche uh, devices that are designed by ourselves mm -hmm. and implemented by ourselves for sort of one-off or maximum, you know, you're going to repeat it two or three times. But there's such essential items, you know, multi tens of millions of dollars items that it just makes sense to do whatever to de-risk it and to uh, ensure that it, uh, it's compliant. So... Understood. Okay, thank you for that. Interesting. And I, I liked what you pointed out earlier too about the simulation and digital twin. It gives you a chance to just work out different scenarios before you actually install it, which makes a big yeah. difference. So, um, Nora, would you like to talk a little bit about women in, in 3D printing now? Oh, absolutely. Um, Great. So, as I say, maybe a stretch. So, up. Oh, actually, gosh, I forgot to show those. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so those are uh, actually some of the parts uh, we've printed and installed. Um, and actually, you can see uh, most of them are actually made of, out of polymers. Uh, there are different reasons to that. I didn't touch base on it before actually doing my, my little talk. Um, but we've made the choice of going with uh, uh, desktop version uh, machines. Uh, so again, we're making a stretch mm -hmm. from what Tali was uh, saying before. So it's good you have like the two representations here. Um, uh, the reason being that uh, we really, we, our goal is to have local manufacturing centers uh, as close as possible to where the need is. Uh, and also right now we're not uh, doing uh, highly critical parts. Um, so we're 
doing most of the parts you see here who are not critical in the sense that they need to be certified, but at least it's a, you know, it gets, gets the momentum going. Uh, and those are parts, uh, well, the crew actually needs. So we're, we're making them um, directly where they need and without any downtime. Um, but we are definitely looking into metal 3D printing. This is the big focus for us this year. Uh, so actually, Tali, I'd be happy to, to chat with you uh, uh, later on. Sure. Um, <laughs> um, because again, we're, we're printer agnostic, so we, we're happy to work uh, with whatever works best and is the closest to the customers. Um, so anyway, uh, with that, let me move on with uh, women in 3D printing. Um, so I think I said it a little bit earlier in my introduction. Uh, so I founded this um, nonprofit about six years ago. Uh, and as I said, well, our goal is to promote, support, and inspire the women in uh, the additive manufacturing space, uh, because we know that there is an issue um, in our industry. Um, as I said, it's course we're between tech and manufacturing uh, we barely have sorry about that uh, we barely have 13 percent uh, of women in this industry and those are the ones we're able to track uh, because one of the beauty of this industry and why it should be diverse is that it's coming we're all coming from different industries I think this panel is actually proof of that uh, we're all coming from different industries and join on additive manufacturing and I'm joining like dozens of panels in the same, you know, with the same dynamic, but coming from fashion, healthcare, uh, dental, we just talked about it a little bit before, uh, aerospace. So, you know, it, it's really touching on different industries and there is no reason why we don't have more diversity. Um, so anyway, our goal with the organization is to, to try to, um, to close this gap. Um, so these are some key numbers. Um, so within six years, we grew a lot. So we now have a community of over 10,000 members, uh, really all across the globe. Uh, all of our events are open to men. We need men to be part of the discussion, actually. Uh, we don't want a women's club. Uh, we want uh, gender equity. So this is important to have men in the discussion. Um, so we are in 25 countries. We have over 65 chapters. Uh, and before COVID-19, all of those chapters would meet uh, in person every month. Uh, and now we've switched all of our events uh, virtual. Uh, so as you said this morning, Suzanne, we actually had a panel this morning uh, on design and innovation. Uh, our next two panels will be announced shortly. It's gonna be on aerospace and sustainability, uh, which I think sustainability might be an interesting topic uh, for the crowd here as well, uh, and aerospace as well, because as I said, there's like a lot of cross and bridges uh, between all of those industries. So things that might be right actually for dental could actually be applied uh, in, all of our industries, uh, uh, oil and gas, maritime, aerospace, why not? So uh, this is really what we're trying to do by featuring only female speakers. So, uh, and always really bringing their own expertise uh, in the additive manufacturing um, and, and the cross industry. So yeah, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> Oh, that's just wonderful. It's, it's so inspiring. It, I, I just, I admire this. I, I respect it. I understand what kind of work it takes behind the scenes. Too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Stunning. It's really great. Congratulations. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, I'm definitely... 10,000 members. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we're now yeah. one of the biggest um, additive manufacturing community uh, globally. It's great. Wow. Well, thank you. This is wonderful. I'm definitely going to get involved. <laughs> oh yeah, please. <laughs> and thank you for, thank you for letting me, uh, sharing about it. <laughs> oh no, it's my, my pleasure. Okay. So we have, um, a question. Let's see. Um, Aaron, you had a question, but now I, I don't see it. Um, oh, Aaron, would you like to ask, open your mic and, and ask your question with your voice? Sure. <laughs> Good evening. Hi. Um, so I've been, I've been printing for a little while too. And so, um, you know, this is an innovation and pivoting moment. So we're trying to figure out, you know, where can we as uh, ex uh, oil and gas people, you know, try to find a living. So one of the, I've noticed is that in the last few years that the big boom that we've had in 3D printing is due to the patents expiring on a lot of this technology. And so you guys are a little bit more in depth than many of us or probably all of us. Uh, but I just want to know what is coming up out there that's about to expire that has got you guys excited to maybe put in towards consumer or your own industrial technologies. That could be for the materials or the process or 
any any part of the three D printing environment. Yeah. So, uh, hey, Aaron. Uh, yeah, happy to to share my view. I mean, I think uh, there's no doubt that the patents expiry, you know, initially in FDM from Stratasys. That's what kind of really, you know, made the industry run really fast forward, right? With uh, you know, Ultimaker and Big Wrap and MakerBot all popping up, and then you had the uh, powder bed uh, patents that uh, caused a lot of metal companies. Um, so there's no doubt that as patents are expiring, that's really what's going to drive the industry forward. Um, I think, though, for me, it's less about the patents expiring. I think it's more about, and Susan, I think you mentioned in the, in the beginning, it's about the convergence of all the different technologies that are kind of maturing at the same time. You know, AI, uh, automation, uh, 3D printing, when all the technologies are, you know, improving so significantly in parallel and the ability to couple them together. I mean, for me, that's the breakthrough innovations that I'm really looking forward to. Oh, that's great. I love it. Yeah, same here, exactly. I mean, actually, that was my answer too, which is, you know, patents aside, uh, I think there will be some opportunities there, but I'm actually personally more excited about this coupling of 3D and AI specifically. I mean, think about AI-assisted or inspired designs. That's a thing these days. You can actually have, you know, AI design objects that, you know, don't belong to anyone in particular, but you have the opportunity to actually realize some of those. Also interesting is the 3D printing of food, medicine, for example, you know, with, uh, with let's say, expired uh, patents. The ability to deliver medicine, for instance, you know, at places that are hard to to reach, uh, to 3D print, uh, let's say, tablets or or food items, could be quite interesting. So. Remember those really elaborate um, eggshells and things for Easter that that people used to <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be an interesting one. Chocolate, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to add my, my two cents to this and take maybe a, just a d different view. Um, I'm actually more excited really about the, the applications that we're seeing right now for additive manufacturing. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely looking forward for more innovation uh, on the printer side, but not so like more 3D printing companies, but more the technology is merging, but not necessarily with AI or other outside technologies, but I would love to see a 3D printer that can do it all. Uh, I'm a little bit sick of having to jungle between like five different printers to have different materials, um, you know, and different processes, different materials, different properties. And I would love to have one printer that does it most of what I need. Um, so I know it's not feasible right now. Uh, I'm just sharing my wish list, um, but um, I, I feel like we're, we're, we might not be pushing that enough. Um, and, and even though I feel like if we really want to truly go towards uh, distributed manufacturing, we need to make it easy. Um, we need to work on the post processing. We need to make those printers easy to use so that anyone can use them and not just desktop printers. We need to make industrial grade printers uh, more accessible. On the software side, there has been a lot of great work done. So most of the software are accessible now. Uh, but the printers, not always. Um, and you also need to have more open source printers, uh, industrial grade open source printer. Uh, and I know what I'm asking is also uh, like more on the wish list and Christmas list <laughs> than uh, reality right now. But uh, I think that would definitely help uh, with uh, distributed manufacturing uh, strategies to have this kind of uh, more like open and sharing um, technology. I love it. It's like the Omni yeah. printer. <laughs> But I hope like what we've seen with uh, COVID-19 and all the 3D printing responses was fantastic. I mean, I, I hate this pandemic, don't get me wrong. I have nothing positive to say about it, but the responses we've seen from 3D printing community has been just phenomenal and fantastic. Uh, and if we could keep that energy uh, in building technology that's actually useful for distributed manufacturing, that would be awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with you. Uh, I, I think it's uh, it's spot on because it, that knowledge is really missing from the market. And it's one thing to have it in a centralized location, but if you're going to have it, you know, East Coast, Midwest, West Coast, and in a bunch of locations, then the knowledge of, of making it easy to use 
and closing the knowledge gap that exists is a must for that vision. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at all the technologies that are being uh, widely uh, dispersed across the world, they've all been super easy to use. Uh, so you, you, we need to simplify the process. And again, not only for desktop printers, we need to simplify the process for industrial, industrial grade printers because the application will come sure. from it. Uh, yeah, we need to, to put it in the hands of people. Great answers. Um, Richard Shu has a couple of questions and I don't know if he'd like to open his mic and ask with his voice. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, one, one question is uh, the standard. So what is the current status of the sort of international standards for 3D printing? If there's any, like from ISO, International Standard Organization, ASTM, etc. So th there, there are a few things. I mean, it's, it's mostly work in progress, I would say. Uh, like, like for any certification, it's mostly per parts, uh, which, can, which is where the challenge is for additive manufacturing because we want this technology to, you know, t we want this to be quickly, you know, and uh, we cannot wait months for a part to be certified if we really want to disrupt supply chain, right? Um, so that's one of the issues we're seeing now. So some of the work that's uh, ongoing is actually about certifying processes uh, rather than individual parts, uh, which also comes with its own challenges. Um, so that's why I'm saying it's work in progress. Um, so we, we've actually worked uh, with the NBGL for uh, uh, standards, specifically in the maritime industry, um, but it is based on some materials and some processes. Uh, and, and we've made it as an application on some parts, um, but it's, yeah, it, it is what it is. It's, it's a work in progress. Oh, that's, that's interesting. It's great. So Richard, you had another question also. Uh, the first one, uh, Hany, uh, he already uh, uh, read it out. Oh, okay. The normal manufacturing QCQA. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that was the one. Okay. Yeah, yeah my question is more like, uh, because now uh, 3D printing is uh, growing uh, really fast, but as a user, I mean, how are you going to uh, I mean, still going to go through some uh, quality control or how you know, some common uh, you know, general questions is like how you, you, you ensure the quality of this thing, uh, kind of uh, avoid some defect or, or as a user, you still want that. Uh, then as a big community, should we need a, a, a common standard for that? So that, that's kind of the uh, starting point. So, so for any uh, manufacturing technologies and, and tools, there are some uh, uh, operating procedures that you need to follow. So uh, if you want to make a part that's going to be used uh, on the field, uh, you cannot just improvise. Uh, you, you need to follow uh, uh, procedures um, and, and QC is part of that. So training is really important, um, which is why I'm back on like simplifying the technology uh, and simplifying the post processing because a lot can happen on the post processing actually and we often uh, overlook uh, that step, uh, even though it is a critical step for additive manufacturing. Um, but you need to follow uh, some procedures. So I have a question. Yeah, I think you... Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I was just going to add, and I think you are seeing a development of more in-situ in monitoring as part of the printing process and everything to ensure the quality of the parts. That makes sense. Okay, so here's my hypothetical question slash business opportunity. <laughs> okay, so let's say that I have a, um, I, I live here in, in Oklahoma, I live near Quarter Horse Farms, and they're, they are really proud of their, their uh, prize horses. And they have several different ranches, and I, I know that a couple of people are building new barns, and new, new ranches and stuff. And I thought, wow, I wonder if they would like to have like the door pulls and door knobs and, and the latches and the cabinet pulls with like horse heads or different little quarter horses. And I, let's say if I had a 3D printer or if I knew of one locally, could I work with that 3D printer and des design um, cabinet knobs and pulls and things to be custom and, and, and do that to like 
um, and work with a builder and, and outfit and custom, custom homes? Yeah, you can absolutely design them. You can also go to kind of online repositories. Uh, there are quite a few of them that already have, you know, stuff that people designed. And, you know, whether or not you have a 3D printer, you can always use uh, kind of a 3D hubs or a service bureau uh, to print it. Okay, so, so there's I think... a lot of many options to use uh, the network of uh, 3D printers out there. So if I'm a startup or a person who just wants to do this on the side and I have a creative urge, I, I can just use, I can outsource the printing of it. I can, um, and I can modify some of the things that I find in the repositories, kind of like going to um, GitHub or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah, like a lot, a lot of universities, you know, like UT and others, they build, you know, this sort of, um, you know, um, innovation space, you know, having some maker bots and what have you, and a design space, and and it's open to others, you know, to even startups to to use for printing, you know, niche uh, components that they want, and I guess it will be open to you as well, you know, you can print your doorknobs <laughs> or other, uh, you know, designer uh, objects. Yeah, I would say the the only limit to this, and you know, I think. Customizing our doorknob, there is no limit to it. Uh, you can go as crazy as you want. Uh, that being said, I would just like to touch base because I think that's a, that's a really good point you're making about uh, intellectual property. Um, so let's say, you know, you want to change your doorknob, fine. There is no intellectual property on it. Um, your coffee machine breaks and you want to change your spare parts because you don't want to buy a new coffee machine. Uh, there might be some IP issues. So I don't think anyone is gonna knock on your door telling you, you know, don't change the spare parts. Uh, but uh, at the industrial level, that might happen. And so that's something to consider. Uh, so whatever you do at, in your home might not be replicable <laughs> uh, at work. That's, I guess, what I wanna say. Um, which is again, back to my question to you, Hanyan, you know, initially uh, for the operators, uh, cause that's what I had in mind. Yeah, yeah no, uh, that's a big deal. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. So you, you want to be careful about that, but that, that would be no limitation. That's, that's really quite interesting. And, you know, one of the things that I've been invol involved with, and Rekha Patel is on the, on the call today too, and um, we've been, she's working on a, a platform that's basically, a, 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 um, she might want to talk about it a little bit, but it's, it's, it's essentially um, a, a, a challenge, um, not a hackathon, but like basically solving problems. But those problems don't have to be just AI abstractions. They could be think, anything that's digital. So I mean, I really, I really like that because like when we have more places where people can try to design or solve and more, more uh, environments, the better. So Rika, would you like to talk? Yeah, so I, I was unmuting myself. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so what um, we are doing is we're building a platform where we're solving, um, in our case, what we're doing is solving for five personas that are required and needed to build any kind of applications going forward. And the five uh, personas are domain experts, data scientists, um, developers, um, uh, business people, and of course the product owners. And in the platform, we have four substrates where um, the first substrate, which we call connect is all about collaboration and bringing people together. Because as you bring more people together, more opportunities will, will arise to collaborate and look at, you know, how can we come together to develop a single solution or uh, come in and uh, build uh, additional solutions and extend solutions. So those opportunities, then we have an AI ML platform in which um, we are, as Susan said, right now we're working with challenges only. Uh, so we're trying to work with industry. Um, and in this case, it's SCG and AAPG, where we're going to bring their challenges, um, call them hackathons or challenges that they want to bring in. And the platform will be unlike others where we will allow um, the challenges to stay up so that there can be continuous improvement and uh, um, 
continuous innovation for people. So it's not like you finish the challenge, you move on so you can continue. And what we want to do is uh, at every step of the way for each one of the personas when they need any kind of training, be it I need um, uh, some petrophysics training and, and I could say, well, hon I see Honey in this um, platform and he's a member and I want him to bring him in for mentorship. I can bring him into my project to get some advice from him. I bring in Susan to talk about interpretation. So I have ability to bring people in and out of my own projects to improve the process. And at the, at the very end, I'll have a marketplace and it could be a marketplace for any apps that are going to come out, but also of course um, services as well. So if I want to come in and I want to say, I'm a structural geologist and I do a services $100 an hour or something, then people can go ahead and say, okay, I need this service, so how can I get, um, how can I bring the service in to improve my projects? So it's all about um, collaborators coming together to uh, create new ideas and opportunities in turn, you know, do acceleration on what they're working on, increase efficiencies, and then uh, make this economical. So the idea was to try and bring silos and try and meet the industry challenges of reducing budgets and reducing staff as well, but in, uh, interacting, um, engaging the staff from all levels so that they could do a better product. I just think it's great because it's, it's focused around a real project. And I think one of the things I don't like about a lot of the networking or collaborative spaces or whatever is that it's too nebulous and you don't know where you need to go. So that's really great. Well, um, looks like we're about out of time. So I wanted to ask the panelists if they wanted to say, have any final little things to say. And then I just wanted to thank everyone. Uh, yeah, so thanks uh, for, uh, for having me. It's been a pleasure, super interesting. And uh, for anybody on the line, you know, feel free to ping me on the LinkedIn and happy to continue the discussions. Thank you. Great, I'll send out um, the recording of this with contact information to everyone too. Yeah, so same here, Thanks. thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm, I hope that was interesting. Uh, <laughs> but you guys had great questions. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, having even more of those. Uh, so same thing, feel free to connect with me uh, on LinkedIn. Otherwise, email is nora at ivaldi.io. Uh, and I'm always happy to have a conversation about additive manufacturing, so. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks again uh, for everyone uh, on the call. Uh, really pleasure to uh, to have the opportunity to talk and to share. Uh, very nice meeting you, Nora and Tally, as well. And um, yeah, look forward to the continuing the conversation. So thank you. Great, thank you. So Larry, did you want to add anything? Oh, I'm still in awe of listening to the <laughs> presentations. So, uh, it's a uh, it's fun and rewarding to be a part of this uh, program series. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate it. I'll just let everybody know that you can expect an email with um, probably a day or so with a link to the recording and contact information. And just really, really want everybody to think about ways to, to utilize the information. So thank you. Bye everyone. Bye now. Bye.